Shalom, shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to Trumpet's Call. I'm Maria. I pray that you are holding on to faith, amuna, and holding on to hope during these times. Today we will be looking into Revelation chapter 12, at least half of it. We will be looking at Revelation chapter 12 as it relates to the woman and the man-child. These astronomical images that are being portrayed to us, what do they mean? And what is the Most High communicating to us through these symbols and the other symbols in this book of Revelation? So we're going to talk about that today. So let's dig right in. Beginning reading, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder, or another word, better word, would be sign, a sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto Yahuwah and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of Yahuwah, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days, that's twelve hundred and sixty days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Hasatan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our Lua and the power of his Mashiach. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before Alua day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Okay, we'll stop reading there in verse 13. So today, we're going to be talking about the woman and the man-child. Now, this is the image that we see being portrayed to us in these verses of Scripture. In the beginning verses, we see this woman She's pregnant. She is in pain to be delivered. She is in anguish. She has a crown of 12 stars on her head. She is being clothed with the sun or being bathed in sunlight. And the moon is under her feet. And there's this dragon that's right there at her feet waiting to receive this child that she's about to bring forth so that it can be destroyed. So this is the symbology that we're seeing here in the beginning verses of Revelation chapter 12. But who was the woman? If you were to consult many Christian commentaries, they insist that the woman is the church. They insist that the woman is the church. And then if you ask them who the 12 stars are, they would say the 12 stars represent the 12 tribes. So the 12 tribes were birthed by the church? I, I don't see that. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. So let's go to scripture and allow scripture to speak about who the woman could possibly be or represent. We're going to be reading in Song of Solomon chapter 6 verses 8 through 10. And we're reading from the Berean Standard Bible version. 
There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and maidens without number. But my dove, my perfect one, is unique, the favorite of her mother who bore her. The maidens see her and call her blessed, Baruch. The queens and concubines sing her praises. Who is this who shines like the dawn, as fair as the moon, as bright as the sun, as majestic as the stars in procession? So we see in these verses of scripture, we see a man who has many maidens and concubines, but there's one that he has that's his favorite. And his favorite, she shines like the dawn, is as fair as the moon, bright as the sun, and as majestic as the stars. This, brothers and sisters, points toward the nation of Yasharal. As the Most High has allowed other nations to come and partake of his bounty of grace through his son Yahusha, the nation of Yasharal will always be his favorite. And so this is the picture we see represented here as the woman in Revelation chapter 12. We also read in Genesis chapter 37, verses 9 and 10. And behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance, meaning they bowed down to me. And he, Joseph, told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves before thee to the earth. So what we see here is our ancestor Yaqub interpreting the dream that the sun, the moon, and the stars represent he, his wife, and the 12 tribes. So we see at the very least that the stars are representative of the 12 tribes. But the nation of Yasharal is also referred to as the woman. And also the city of Yarushalam, Jerusalem, is referred to as a woman. Okay, a woman pained to be delivered. So summarizing, this is a picture of the nation of Yasharal. She is with child and she is desperate to be delivered of this child because she's in pain. She's travailing to be delivered. She's got a dragon at her feet waiting to devour her child as soon as it's born. Okay, so let's look at scripture with regard to a woman in pain to be delivered. Let's see what references we can discover that will let us know what is being said by this reference to being in pain to be delivered. We read in Micah chapter 4 verse 10, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For thou shalt go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt even go to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There Yahuwah shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. So we see here a picture of a woman, the daughter of Zion, travailing and being sent into captivity. So right off the bat, it appears to us that this imagery of a woman travailing in birth is a sign of going into captivity, being in captivity, or coming out of captivity. It's the pain of confinement, of being confined in a place where you don't want to be, and not being able to end it until the Most High says, your time is ended. And so we see here in Micah chapter 4 that the daughter of Zion is going into Babylon, into captivity, and it's being referred to as being in travail to be delivered. In Jeremiah or Yeremiah chapter 4 verse 31 we read, For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hand, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. Once again, we see an image here of the daughter of Zion of Yasharal, being in trouble, needing to be delivered, going into captivity, facing murderers, facing those who are bringing the judgment of the Most High against her. Okay, so let's continue. In Yaramaya who, chapter 30, verses 6 and 7, we read, Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail? 
and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's, Yacoub's trouble, but he shall be saved or delivered out of it. Once again, we see this imagery of travailing with child. So I think we can summarize safely that travailing with child, that imagery in the scripture is, is a sign that points to trouble, tribulation, testing, captivity, judgment. Okay. We see men travailing in, in birth to be delivered. And so this reference here clearly points to the fact that this woman in Revelation chapter 12 is being judged in some way that's causing her lots of pain. One final scripture on this topic, Yashar Yahu, Isaiah 26, 17. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Yahuwah. Once again, another reference to a woman with child coming near the time of her delivery and crying out to the Most High for deliverance from captivity, from trouble, from trial, from tribulation, from the hand of the enemy. So we see this woman. We now understand that this is a picture of the nation of Yasharal either in trouble, about to go into trouble, or crying out to be delivered from some trouble that she's currently in. In verse 4 we read, And his tail drew the third part of stars of the heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to Yahuwah and to his throne. So who's this child? I think right off the bat, many of us would say, this is Yahusha, right? It's Yahusha. And you're absolutely correct. This is Yahusha. But the father wanted me to indicate that there are two fulfillments to this prophecy that we see. There are two fulfillments, and we're going to get to that as we continue on in this lesson. But let's talk about the first fulfillment that we see here, the man-child. We read in Yahu, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. This is the child. This is the child in Revelation chapter 12. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son, the son of the Most High, is given. And the government, the government of the nation of Yasharal shall be upon his shoulder. Okay, so we see very clearly stated in these scriptures that the child is Messiah. Messiah is the child that was born to the nation of Yasharal. The nation of Yasharal birthed Messiah, so he is the salvation of the nation that birthed him into the world. Okay? This is symbology. This is symbolically speaking we're talking about here. Continuing. We also read in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. We're seeing an image here of the Ancient of Days, who is the Father himself. He sits on his throne, and he's being ministered to by myriads upon myriads upon myriads of angelic hosts. And it reads, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So the angels are bringing Yahusha near unto the Ancient of Days. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So we see here this idea of the kingdom being given unto him, and he will rule all nations with a rod of iron. We see this child that's been given. He is the son of the highest that's been given for the nation of Yasharal, and he will sit on the throne of his father David and rule in righteousness forever and ever and ever. So he will rule all nations with a rod of iron. So we know who the woman is, we know who the child is, and we can see the child ruling on the throne of his father David. And we see the child who is now an adult, who has grown into his maturity, learned obedience through the things that he suffered, who was faithful unto death, and who was rewarded and given a name above every human name. 
and given a kingdom that will last forever. Verse 6. And the woman fled to the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of her of Yahuwah, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Okay, so we see here the image of the dragon. The dragon having seven heads and ten horns upon his head, and then seven crowns. This also is imagery. It's not an actual dragon. It's imagery. It's pointing to something. So what's it pointing to? Let's read Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Just a note here that iron is a reference to Rome. Iron in the scripture is always a reference to Rome. Continuing. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So in Daniel chapter 7, we read about the four beasts, and this is the fourth beast that Daniel is describing, and he's saying that it's different from all the beasts that have gone before it. And what we see in this fourth beast is the dragon in Revelation chapter 12. They're the same. Even though it may not look the same, they're the same. And you have a picture on the screen of Daniel's fourth beast. It has seven heads and ten horns. Heads in the scriptures represents kingdoms, and so do mountains, leaderships, kingdoms, and horns in the scriptures represent power or authority or might. And what we see there is an amalgamation of all of the kingdoms that have gone before. We have the Babylonian kingdom and the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans all rolled up into one big unholy mess, essentially. Kingdoms ruling. So the Babylonians began to rule, but they ruled having taken some of their pagan idolatry from the Egyptians, okay, that predated them. And then the Medes and the Persians defeated the Babylonians, and they took some of the pagan revelry and the pagan practices from the Babylonians and the Egyptians and the Assyrians, and they brought it in, into their rule. When the Medes and the Persians were defeated by the Greeks, the Greeks adopted everything that had come before them. And then finally, the Romans. The Romans took and adopted everything that had come before them. The Assyrian doctrine, the Babylonian doctrine, the Medes and the Persian, the Medo-Persian doctrine, and also Greek thought. All of that was enculturated and amalgamated into this Roman idea and this Roman ideal. And that is why it's a beast. It's a combination of different things, different ideas, religious ideas. Okay, that is why it's a beast. It's Daniel's fourth beast. And Daniel's fourth beast is the dragon. The dragon empowers it and rules and reigns over it. That's why we see the picture of a dragon. So we see this fourth beast represented as the dragon in Revelation chapter 12 that's about to devour the child as soon as the child is born. And this is a picture of Rome. This is a picture of Rome under the rule of Herod the Great attempting to destroy the man-child, Yahusha, as he was born. The father protected him. He served his mission and he was caught up to the father's throne. Okay, this is what we see. We see the Medes and the Persians and the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans, all of these political powers being wrapped up in this Roman Empire that is still ruling today. It is still ruling, still. Some people say it passed away, but it did not. It split into East and West, but the Western Roman Empire is alive and well in the United States and in Europe. The Eastern Roman Empire is alive and well in Russia and China. You see the coming battle that's coming between East and West? It's spiritual, brothers and sisters. It's all spiritual. Okay? So now we have a better idea of who the dragon is. The dragon represents the political power structure of the time. And that would be encapsulated in pagan Rome, ruling at that time, at the time that Messiah was born. But Rome 
would become not only a pagan entity, but also an ecclesiastical entity as it took on papal powers in times to come. And that dragon run papal entity would persecute the woman who gave birth to the man child. And that woman being the nation of Yasharah. So we see this imagery of the dragon being kicked out of the heavenly realms. There was a war. There was a war between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels, and they fought. And the dragon was booted out. There was no longer any room for him anymore in the heavenly realms. The dragon meaning Hasatan, he was booted out of the heavenly realms. He who made constant accusation before the Most High against us, there was no longer room found for him anymore. So he was kicked out. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Hasatan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now was come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our Yahuwah, and the power of his Mashiach. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before Yahuwah day and night. Just imagine that, brothers and sisters, being accused for the things that you have done before the Most High by the accuser of the brethren, Hasatan, day and night. But the Father says, you're no longer allowed to be here. I'm no longer going to allow you to accuse my people before me. Why? Something must have happened where they were no longer able to bring accusation against the Most High's people. And also the question is, when? When was the dragon cast out? Was he cast out in times past? Was he cast out when Messiah was on the earth? Is that a future fulfillment? He's yet to be cast out? If you talk to 10 different people, I'm sure you get at least five different answers. Okay, But we're going to give you what we believe scripture is saying today regarding the dragon and him being cast out of the heavenly realms. We read in John chapter 12, verses 31 and 33. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Now, brothers and sisters, this is Messiah talking. Who is he referring to? Who is the prince of this world? We know it's Hasatan. So he's telling us in Yehukanon chapter 12, now is the time of the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world being cast out. So it's a noun thing. It's happening when Messiah was on the earth. Let's continue. Verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So Messiah is telling us in Yehukanon chapter 12 that the judgment has come and the prince of this world will be cast out because he's being lifted up from the earth and he's drawing everyone unto him and we're taking on his righteousness. And if we take on his righteousness, the dragon, the accuser of the brethren, the prince of this earth, can no longer accuse us before the Father because we have been made righteous in Messiah. So no longer is there able to be any accusation. So he gets booted out. He can't accuse us before the Father anymore because we stand in Yahushua's righteousness. Continuing, we read in Yehukanon chapter 16, verses 7 through 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go unto my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged. Once again, we see consistency between Yehukanon chapter 12 in Yehukanon chapter 16, Yahushua is telling us that the prince of this world is judged and he will be booted out, cast out of the heavenly realms, no longer able to accuse us before the Father. So scripture is clear in indicating to us that the prince of this world has been judged and he has been cast out 
into the earth. And he has great wrath because he knows that he has a specified period of time in order to do what he wants to do in the earth. And what is that? According to Revelation chapter 12, it's persecute the woman who brought forth the man child. We read in 1 Peter, Kapha, chapter 5, verse 18. It reads, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He walketh about in the earth realm. We also read in Job, chapter 1, verse 7, And Yahuwah said unto Hasatan, Whence cometh thou? And then Hasatan answered Yahuwah, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down in it. Okay, so we see that even during the time of Job, Hasatan had access to the heavenly realms and the earthly realm. But after Messiah conquered him, he was only allowed to be in the earthly realms. Perhaps even kicked out of the second heavens and down to the first heavenly realm. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, we read, and he said unto them, this is Messiah speaking, I beheld Hasatan as lightning fall from heaven. Once again, this evidence that he has fallen to the earth realm and he is here and has been here persecuting the Most High's people. To continue on this theme, we read in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, and blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the tree. So what we're seeing here is that we were dead in trespasses and sins, and there was a handwriting of ordinances against us, a list, as it were, of offenses that we had made. And at any time, Hasatan could go look at that list of offenses and say, yeah, Abba Yahuwah, look at your child. They did this, they did that, they did this, they did that, they did this, they did that, and accuse us before the Father. Messiah took those ordinances and nailed them to the tree. He took the penalty for our sin as he is the sacrificial lamb of Yahuwah that takes away the sins of the nation of Yasharal and those who cleave to the nation of Yasharal. And what else did he do? He took the ordinances, nailed them to his tree, the tree that he hung on, and then, verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them. He goes, okay, you want to accuse my people? I'll show you now what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the penalty for their sins, and I'm going to grant them my righteousness. What do you have to say now? What do you have to say now? And he silenced them. He silenced them so that they are no longer able. Hasatan is no longer able to come and accuse you before the Father if you're under the blood of Yahusha, if you have claimed forgiveness, and if you are keeping Most High's commandments and doing what is pleasing in His sight. He can't accuse you because your righteousness is of Messiah, not of yourself. So back to Revelation chapter 12. So we see this idea of the persecution of the nation of Yasharal. The woman is being persecuted by Hasatan. So when did this take place? When was the woman persecuted? Well, I guess the question would be, when hasn't the woman been persecuted? The nation of Yasharal in one way, shape, or form has been under some form of occupation, war, battle, struggle for a long time. And some of it, part of it, most of it is due to are sitting against the Most High and the Most High allowing our enemies, the dragon, to come against us and to defeat us. It comes as a result of us being in disobedience. So the Father allows us to be persecuted and to be subjugated by our enemies. But when you look at this time that we're in and you see Messiah on the earth, you see Messiah go back to the heavenly realms to go back to the Father. And then we see persecution break out against those who are new in the faith. We see Rome sending out armies and soldiers, attacking, persecuting, killing those who are spreading this new basora, this new good news to come and bring other brethren into the faith, those who are of the lost tribes and those who are of the southern kingdom, 
teaching and preaching and, and bringing our brethren into the faith, there is persecution, mass wide scale persecution against those who are called followers of the way. And we see the apostle Shaul indicated in the persecution of his brethren as he stood party to the stoning of Stephen. Okay. So we see the dragon wroth with the woman who gave birth to the man child and is persecuting the woman, the nation of Yasharal. And it continues. It continues today, as a matter of fact, and we're waiting for it to end. We are in pain to be delivered from our persecution. We're crying out to the father and saying, deliver us, deliver us from this persecution. We are in pain to be delivered because we sinned against you. And we know that we're experiencing these things because we sinned against you. Deliver us, forgive us. We are with child because we are reaping where we have sown. Before we get into overcoming by the blood of the lamb, I want to briefly discuss this concept of the 1260 days. So we have been speaking about the persecution of the nation of Yasharal by the Romans, by the dragon who empowers the Roman kingdom, which is an amalgamation of all the kingdoms that have come before it. And so we see this happening though to our people over time. But in the scripture here, it says, that the woman was allowed to flee into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of Yahuwah that she should be fed there 1,203 score days, 1,260 days. And I have a video in which I discuss that the 1,260 days are actually 1,260 years and that those faithful who were able and allowed to escape the Roman Hebrew war that ensued and the judgment that came, the enslavement and the wide scale death and destruction that came to our people in the Roman Jewish Hebrew war, they went into Europe, many of them. Many of them were able to escape. They found a place prepared of them of Yahuwah where they're able to thrive. They built up civilization, they built castles, they built infrastructure, they built up Europe. And many of them did very well for themselves. They were very well to do, very wise, keeping Torah. And in time, eventually, they found themselves falling under persecution. Because remember, the place of safety that was to be prepared for the woman who fled into the wilderness was to last 1260 years. And after that 1260 year period, you find the persecution beginning to break out against our people in Europe. So much so that by the 1300s, you find them fleeing from location to location, from Spain to Portugal, from the areas within Europe where they're being persecuted and they're being told, no, you can't keep Torah. No, you can't do this. You have to wear this band indicating that you are Jewish, that you are not Christian. And so they began to experience persecution in this place of safety that the father had created for them because the place of safety was only to last 1260 years. So the dragon now working through the Roman empire is bent on destroying the woman who gave birth to the man child. So how do they survive it? Those who survived, how do they survive? How is it that we weren't all wiped out? We see here in verse 11, and they overcame him, meaning the dragon, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. There are our ancestors who lived after Messiah went back to the heavenly realms who were willing to give their lives to share this truth, the truth of the Besorah. There were those who who suffered being boiled in oil, being crucified upside down. There are those who were pierced with swords. There are those who were fed to lions. Great was the persecution of our people that we experienced in the first century. But from that, the father preserved from himself a remnant. He always preserves a remnant. And that remnant found a place of safety in the other parts of the world particularly in Europe. But those who overcame, even if they ended up dying, they overcame by the blood of the lamb 
and by the word of their testimony. They testified that they had faith in Yahusha and that they were bound and determined to keep the commandments of the Most High Yahuwah. Continuing, reading in Yahshayahu, Isaiah chapter 66, verses 7 through 10. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall the nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith Yahuwah? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith Yahuwah? Rejoice ye with Yerushalam, and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all ye that mourn for her. And then these verses of scripture goes on to talk about the salvation of Yasharal, the deliverance of Yasharal, and the gathering of the remnant of the nation of Yasharal from all the places to which we've been scattered. It goes on to say these things in Isaiah chapter 66. So we can see that we're talking about a fulfillment of these things that has yet to come. So we see this woman travailing juxtaposed against the woman travailing in the book of Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, the woman was in pain to be delivered. She was in pain. She was in anguish, ready to be delivered. But we see this woman, it says, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. So we see two situations here. One, being delivered from position of pain and anguish, and the other, being delivered from the tribulation starts, I'm out. I'm taken out. I'm delivered. And I'm coming forth as a nation in one day. It sounds like a gathering to me. It sounds like the Most High is speaking to us here in Isaiah 66, indicating a time that Zion would be in a captive state. But before the dragon could come once again to try to devour her child as soon as it was born, that they would be gathered out, that they would be taken to a place of safety, and they would be born as a nation all at once in one day. We see this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 66. And in this time, we see another man-child being delivered. Another man-child. We know that the man-child in Revelation chapter 12 is Yahusha, the child and the son that was given. But who is this child in Yahshayahu chapter 66? Seems to me as if the nation of Yasharal is yet again birthing another son, another child. Let's take a look. Reading in Revelation chapter 11. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of Yahuwah, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city, they shall tread underfoot forty and two months. Okay, I wanted to make a note here, that this measuring that's happening, this measuring of the temple, is an indication of the act that occurs before judgment commences. Before the Most High brings judgment upon his nation, he always throws down a plumb line. And that is what this measuring is referring to. It's referring to the plumb line measuring where the Most High measures his nation against his standard. And if they're found lacking or wanting, they go into judgment, they go into captivity and the like. And so you see here, those that are on the altars, in the altars, in the inner courts, and in the most holy place, they're safe, they're spared. But those who are in the outer courts, those who are fake and phony, those who are pretending to be in the faith and aren't in the faith, those who are pretending to keep the commandments and aren't really keeping the commandments, the scripture says that those areas are given unto the Gentiles and they'll be trampled underfoot for 42 months. And indeed, Jerusalem was compassed with armies and under siege for five months before they were finally defeated. But we see that this is a picture 
of the Most High telling his nation, the judgment is coming. These terms and these symbols are very Hebraic. And when you read them from a Hebrew perspective, you can see what the Father is saying. So in Revelation chapter 11, we see the plumb line. We see an indication that the temple, which temple we are, we are the temple of the Most High, is about to be weighed in the balance. And if found lacking, those who are found lacking will fall under judgment. But Messiah gave warning to his disciples and his disciples gave warning to their followers and to their family members and to their friends. Messiah said, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, flee to the mountains, get out of Dodge. And those who heeded were safe. Continuing. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy 1,200 three score days, 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the Elua of the whole earth. Those who are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks are the northern tribe and the southern tribe of the nation of Yasharal. So the two witnesses of the Most High are the northern tribe and the southern tribe, but not all of them. The Father chooses for himself those whom he deems faithful out of the 12 tribes. So out of the tribe of Judah, he chooses 12,000. Out of the tribe of Issachar, he chooses 12,000. Out of the tribe of Ephraim, he chooses 12,000, and so on and so forth. So we see this idea of the Most High specifying within the larger nation of Yasharal, those who are to be called out for a particular service unto the Most High. And I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that this is the man-child of Isaiah chapter 66. The man-child of Isaiah 66 are those who are chosen by the Most High to be the special messengers of his Son. They're chosen to bring forth the Basora. They're chosen to do mighty deeds and mighty works and mighty acts. They're chosen to follow the Lamb with us or ever he goeth. They are those who are strong and mighty. And when they speak, they have the power of the Most High that follows those words that they speak. These are symbolized by the 144,000 in the scriptures. Verse 5. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, fire being the Torah of the Most High and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have the power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, just like Elijah. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood, just like Moses, Masha, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, this dragon, the dragon that has persecuted the woman, for a long time, this dragon kills them, causes them to be put to death. And their dead bodies lie in the streets of the great city called Sodom in Egypt, where our dawn was crucified. And that city is Jerusalem. And all the kindreds of the earth and the tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to the other, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the Ruach of life, the spirit of life from Yahuwah entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven, in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Brothers and sisters, what we're seeing here is an image of the man-child that was born to be conformed to the image of Messiah. These are those who are virgins. These are those who follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These are sons of the Most High. These are those who have been so conformed 
to Messiah, that they follow the very pattern of his life. Messiah was sent to bring forth the message in the word of the Father. These are sent to bring forth the message in the word of the Father. Messiah was sent with power and authority. These will be sent with power and authority. Messiah was allowed to be killed by the Roman beast system. These will be killed by the Roman beast system. Messiah resurrected three and a half days later. These will resurrect three and a half days later. They follow exactly the pattern of Messiah. And they are those who will sit on his right hand and his left hand in glory. These are those who are called overcomers. As we read in Revelation chapter two and three, Messiah talks to the seven assemblies and says, for him that overcome, I will give this gift and that gift. To him that overcomes, I will do this and I will do that. These are the overcomers. These are they who have overcome and have partaken of the bounty that is the blessing of the Most High, and they are now deemed sons of the Most High Yahuwah. And as Messiah was in the world, so are they. They have been so conformed with him that they stand with him on Mount Zion, as in Revelation chapter 14. They are his bride, brothers and sisters. They are his bride. They are the sons of the Most High, and they are the bride of Messiah. They have been chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. In Revelation chapter 2, we read, He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Ruach, what the Spirit says unto the assemblies. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Yahuwah. So these will be in paradise with Yahusha. They will eat of the tree of life which simply means they inherit eternal life. Verse 10, Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee a crown of life. So they receive a crown of life for their faithful service. Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 through 28, And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. They will rule all nations with a rod of iron, just like Yahusha. They will rule along with him because they will be seated upon his throne, on his right hand and on his left hand. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give them the morning star. Yahusha is the morning star, and he's telling us, I will give these overcomers myself. They will be one with me. They will be my bride. Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess him before my father and before his angels. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Hasatan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them which that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. To him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my Elua, and he shall go no more out. The overcomers, they come to live in the bosom of the Father. They are fixtures, permanent fixtures in the temple of the Most High, in the heavenly realm, and they do not leave. Which is an indication of their service in the temple as priests, and also the fact that they live they dwell and they abide with father and son. And they leave, but they come right back home. And Yahushua goes on to say, 
And I will write upon him the name of my Lua, which is Yahuwah, and the name of the city, which is Jerusalem, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my Lua, and I will write upon him my new name. Now, brothers and sisters, we have done two lessons on names and why names are important. There are two instances in which someone writes his name upon someone else, and that is adoption and marriage. And what we're seeing here is the adoption of these sons into the Most High's throne room, into his realm. They are now sons of the highest, just like Yahusha, and they are also the bride of Messiah, the bride of Mashiach. Mashiach says, I will write upon him my new name. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. The overcomers sit on Yahushua's right hand and on his left hand, and they share his rulership They share his authority. They rule the nations with a rod of iron, just like Yahushua does. Matthew, Matayahu, chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. And Yahushua answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. And so this parable goes on to say that he opened the door wide for others in the streets and the highways and the byways to come and be guests at the wedding. And indeed, that is what happened. The Gentiles were able to come in and be guests at the wedding that the father is ordaining for his son. The father is the king who made a marriage for his son. The father is married to the nation of Yashara. He divorced the northern kingdom, but the northern kingdom was brought back in through Messiah, through those who would be united with him and connected with him, believe in him, trust in him. They were then able to come back in to union with the father and back into covenant relationship with the father through the son. But the father ordained a marriage for his son, a covenant, a marriage covenant for his son. We further read in Matthew chapter 25, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. The number ten in the scriptures was representative of the totality of something. So the number 10 is representative of the whole nation of Yasharal. Number five is representative of grace, and it's also representative of those who have prepared and are ready. So five were ready, and five had not prepared and were not ready. Five of them were wise, and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Hallelujah. So you know the story. The wise had extra oil. The foolish did not. The wise told the foolish, nope, we're not going to give you our oil. You go buy for yourself. So the foolish went and they bought for themselves. And when they did that, the bridegroom came. Verse 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready, they that were ready, went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. And behind the door is consummation. When a bride and a groom come together and the bride is brought to the father's house and they shut the door, there's consummation happening there. So this marriage is being consummated and the groom is getting to intimately know the bride. Okay? That's what's happening here. They're coming to know one another intimately. 
Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Adon, Adon, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I am not intimately involved with you. I don't know you as a man knows his wife. I don't know you like that. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And this is being told to us because the Son of Man is the bridegroom and he's coming for the bride. And when he comes for the bride, the bride has to be ready to be received and to be brought into the Father's house so that the marriage can be consummated. Now notice, the other foolish virgins, they came. They were able to come and knock on the door. So that means they attained unto salvation. They just didn't attain unto the high calling. And this is what I believe the Father wants us to know right now. There are those of us within the nation who think that we have a calling that we don't have. There are different and varying degrees of salvation. There are varying degrees of reward and punishment within the kingdom. Being married to Yahusha and being considered a son is the high top prize within the kingdom. It's the pinnacle of pinnacle of prizes that you can attain to. It doesn't happen for everybody. Not everybody gets it. And so it would be a travesty to think that you are going to attain onto the high calling when you could be one of the foolish virgins who has not prepared, who has no oil for their lamps. And he's telling us, there's a marriage coming. Are you going to be part of the guests? Or are you going to be the bride? It all depends on how we prepare now. Now was a day of our preparation. Because when the call goes out, behold, the bridegroom cometh, there will be no time to prepare. The time is now. Continuing, then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, came to Yahusha with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in the places of honor next to you on your throne, one on your right and the other on your left. But Yahusha answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? Notice, brothers and sisters, those who sit in the places of honor next to the Messiah, on the right hand, on the left hand, Messiah is saying, you're going to go through some things. You're going to be asked to drink from this bitter cup of suffering that I am drinking from. You are going to have to be conformed to my image. You may have your body laying out in the streets for three and a half days without having someone put it in the grave. You may be beheaded. You may be hung on a tree. You may have these things happen to you in order to attain unto this high calling. He's saying, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the cup that I'm drinking from? And, and they replied, yes, we are able. And he told them, you indeed will drink from this bitter cup. You will. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right hand or my left. For my father has prepared those places for the ones that he has chosen. Why? Because it is the father who is making a marriage for his son. And the father chooses the bride. The father chooses the bride for his son. Hallelujah. The father is making a marriage for his son, Yahusha, and the father chooses the bride. And right now the father is looking high and low throughout the whole earth, choosing those whom he has said, this one, that one, that one, you're all going to be part of the bride of my son. And those will sit in places of honor in the kingdom on Yahusha's right hand and on his left. And they, along with Yahusha, will rule over the nations with a rod of iron. They are the child that's being born, that's being birthed out of the nation of Yasharal, as foretold in Isaiah chapter 66. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 22 through 28. As in Adam, Adam, all die. Even so in Christ, in Mashiach, 
shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ or Mashiach, the first fruits, and afterward they that are Mashiachs at his coming. I'm going to pause here because I believe that there is something that's missing from this verse of scripture. And it's something very simple. It's a comma. It's a comma. And this is what I mean by that. Here we see the Apostle Shaul giving us a list. He's telling us everyone's going to be revived and resurrected, but everyone has to wait their turn. Okay? Messiah is first on the list. Messiah was resurrected first. Okay? And then he's saying, and then this, and then this, and then this. He's giving us a list of who goes first, who goes second, who goes third, so on and so forth. It's not much of a list if you only get two choices. So as if to say, everybody has to wait their turn. First I go, then all you millions. That, that's not much of a, a differentiation. It's not much of a differentiation at all, okay? It's not worthy of saying, this is a list. But when you look at this list that the Apostle Shaul is giving us, there's another way to read that. What if we read it this way? Mashiach, comma, the first fruits, comma, afterward, they that are Mashiachs at his coming. It's possible. It's possible that you have Messiah who's resurrected first, and then you have those deemed the first fruits, the overcomers, the bride, those whom the Father has chosen to sit on Messiah's right hand and on his left. And then also those who belong to him when he returns to the earth at his coming. So that would be three categories, Messiah first, then the first fruits, and then those who are his at his coming. And what are the first fruits? The first fruits are those who have ripened on the vine first. They are representative of the barley harvest. The barley harvest is the first harvest in the year, in the spring, and the barley ripens before anything else. These are representative of the barley. And then the larger harvest happens at the wheat harvest in the summertime, in the early summer. The barley harvest relates to first fruits and the afterward and the harvest that comes afterward relates to the wheat. That's the majority of the harvest. That's the majority of the people of the nation of Yasharal would fall into that category. Many are called, but few are chosen. Okay? Continuing. So we see the Apostle Shaul praying that he could attain to this high calling. We see him saying in verse 9 that he desires to be found in him, meaning Messiah, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, which is Torah, me trying to attain unto righteousness by trying to keep the Torah in my own strength, but that which is through faith of Yahusha, Hamashiach, the righteousness which is of Yahuwah by faith, that I may know him, that I may be intimate with him that I may know him as a man knows a woman or as a woman knows a man, that I may know him. That Greek word is gnosko, that I may gnosko him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Now we just read a moment ago about those who received the resurrection first, first Messiah, then the first fruits, then there are those who belong to him as he returns back to the earth. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Do you see this, brothers and sisters, that the apostle Shaul recognizes that in order to be conformed to the image of, of Messiah, in order to be chosen as his bride, in order to attain unto the high calling, it takes a certain measure of suffering to be conformed to the image of Messiah because we learn obedience in the things that we suffer. He knew that. And so he's indicating here that we're being united with Messiah through the fellowship of his sufferings and we're being made conformable unto his death. And then he goes on to say, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, it is his desire to be received by Messiah of Messiah and to be revived and to have that heavenly body that Messiah has. He goes on to say, 
not as though I had already attained. I am not there yet. I haven't arrived. I'm not there. Either we're already made perfect. I haven't been made perfect yet. But brethren, he goes on to say, I count not myself to have apprehended it. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forth, I reach forth into those things which are before me, and I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of, of Yahuwah in Yahushua Hamashiach. That is sonship. That is the bride ship. That is sitting on Messiah's right hand and his left hand. It is the, it is the prize. It is the highest of the highest prize offered by the Father to be conformed to the exact image of his Son, to be chosen as his bride, and to rule and reign with him, sitting on his throne. That is the pinnacle. It is the peak. And that is what the Apostle Shaul is striving for. He tells us, I'm pressing forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling. He's saying, I want that high calling. I want to be conformable unto Messiah. I'll suffer with him, he's saying. I want to be resurrected, and I want to know him intimately. This is what he's saying. They don't teach us this in Christianity. In Christianity, everybody's the bride. In Christianity, as long as you say the sinner's prayer, you're the bride. Mm Mm-mm, not so. Not so, not so. The father chooses the bride for his son. And not everyone will be chosen. In the same way, the Most High chose the nation of Yasharal. But not everyone was a Levite. The Levites were chosen for special service unto the Most High. But not everyone in the nation got chosen to be a Levite. Only the Levites were Levites. And not everyone will be chosen to be the bride of Mashiach, to have this high calling. It is a choice made by the Father. It's a choice made by the Father. Our job is to do what we can to make ourselves ready. Our job is to be like those five wise virgins who have our lamp and extra oil so that when the call goes out, behold, the bridegroom cometh, we're ready. We wake up from our slumber, we trim our lamps, and we're ready to go meet the bridegroom. Hallelujah. One final verse of scripture for today. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. May we, brothers and sisters, seek after that high calling, that high calling which is to be united with Messiah in marriage. The nation of Yasharal is already married to the Father. Messiah was sent by the Father to be the mediator of a new and better covenant based on better promises. And he is the ratifier of that covenant made in his blood. We have that renewed covenant through him. And those who believe in him by faith partake of that new covenant and we get to be the father's children and live in the new Yerushalam if we are so fortunate to gain proximity. But within this covenant, there's a promise of something greater. There's a promise of sonship, of bridehood with the son as the father sets out to make a marriage for his son. The father is choosing from the remnant seed of the daughter of Zion, a bride for his son. And those who were chosen will be just like him. They will look like him and act like him and talk like him and think like him and live in the father's bosom just like he does. It truly is the highest of the highest of callings. Hallelujah. May we be so baruched as to be chosen for this high calling, to be able to escape to the Son and be united with Him forever. Hallelujah. Well, I thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining me once again on the channel and for another teaching in our Revelation series. 
We will continue on in this Revelation series, Revelation chapter 12, as the Most High leads. But for today, this is what he wanted me to bring out, that there is a marriage that's coming. The father is making a marriage for his son. And not everyone's invited. Not everyone gets to be a part of the bridal group. But if we're so baruched, we'll get to be a part of the guests. Yes, we get to feast during the bridal week. Hallelujah. Some of us in union with the son as his bride and others as friends and relatives of the bride and of the groom. There's a wedding coming, brothers and sisters. There's a wedding coming. Are you invited? And if you are, are you coming? Make sure you get your bridal garment ready. Hallelujah. May the Most High Baruch can keep you, brothers and sisters. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom, shalom, peace in every area. And may we prepare ourselves to meet the bridegroom. And may we be so baruched as to be chosen of the Most High to be conformed to the image of his Son. Shalom and shalom, brothers and sisters.